Okay, are we ready? Yes. Let's go. Let's go. For the esophageal. This is actually a very interesting topic for me because um, this is what keeps me awake always when I'm uh, on duty at the clinics. And when I mean when, I, when I'm on duty, I'm practi practically, I was practically every day on duty. So um, in gastroenterology and in endoscopy, the only emergency cases that you might even, that you might have is most, most of the cases will be foreign body uh, retrievals. And a small percentage of uh, cases will be peg tubes that you placed and that are misplaced. These are the um, emergency uh, cases in uh, foreign bodies. So let's have a review, a small review on the instrumentation that we use, the retrieving, um, uh, the retrieval accessories, actually. It depends on what you like most. We have a lot of basket um, uh, retrieval forceps for um, objects that are round, that are circular, like small balls or, um, or for example, uh, ping pong balls and tennis balls. The tennis balls are a bit tricky, and I will tell you about that. About that. Um, snares. Uh, we have uh, this for coins that has these two teeth uh, here. We have for clothes, uh, these pronged uh, uh, jaw uh, forceps. We have a lot of, and these ones as well are for these four or a five pronged uh, are for softer material like uh, clothes, uh, socks and stuff like that. And also we have a lot of alligator jaws and rat tooth in order to grasp um, more uh, harder uh, objects like, for example, plastic materials or toys or uh, things like that. I will talk a bit later about the gastric balloon removal kit. Let's have um, a look at the devices for coins and um, other needles, blades, pins, and stuff like that. It's the rat tooth because the rat tooth can actually have a very, very hard uh, grasp on hard objects. And also we have uh, other retrieval forceps for bigger uh, bugs like the alligator jaws or the rat tooth alligator jaws. What I have found this is something that um, I do not recommend. It's something that I use though, and I have experience with. This is the balloon that they use, the gastric balloon that they use in humans, because I also attend every Thursday. Um, I would go to a human uh, gastroenterology clinic. So we would place a lot of uh, balloons for uh, obesity in people. And this is actually the device to remove this balloon. And I found that very, very handy for very hard objects that you cannot grasp because these pins go into this object. The, the uh, ugly part with that is that if you cannot grasp the object and retrieve it from the esophagus or from the, uh, from the stomach, these pins are uh, so much embedded in the foreign body that you cannot take them out. So you either have to um, destroy your uh, this kit um, and or cut it somehow uh, because you cannot. If you cannot remove it, then it's very difficult to disentangle it from the foreign object. But this is very very handy for big. Uh, for uh, objects that are very difficult to uh, manipulate. They have a very um, firm grasp. And then there are other things uh, that might accessorize, that might help you in your endoscopic adventure, like the overtube. I tend to use overtubes a lot, and I'm going to show you how, how, because it protects your endoscope, it protects the esophagus, it protects um, from sharp, sharp objects like um, scissors or uh, glasses. And um, like you see here, there, there is this protective cover as well in uh, for, for the endoscope and this protective cover. And this is how the, the pin gets into the uh, overtube so that it protects both the patient but your endoscope as well from uh, getting uh, damages. Let's see how we use the overtube. So here we have um, a bone embedded in the esophagus and it cannot, I've tried a lot of times with my grasping forceps to move it, but it doesn't move. So what we do is that I'm trying, I've put this overtube 
and I'm trying to with this is my grasping forceps. The metallic object that you see is my grasping forceps. So with circular gentle movements, I am trying to put all the foreign body in uh, the uh, overtube. And this way, I uh, actually succeed two things. The first thing that I succeed is that I always keep my lumen distended. And it's distended with a diameter bigger than the diameter of the endoscope. So as I go out, the lumen is always distended and my foreign body can come all into the lumen. And even if it cannot, this keeps my, um, uh, the, it keeps actually my uh, lumen open so that uh, I can retrieve uh, with uh, very, very gentle moves all the foreign bodies up uh, to the esophagus or even to put them in the stomach as you saw because sometimes it's not easy to retrieve uh, a foreign body, but it's very easy to push it on in the stomach. And if it's plastic object, then you will need, of course, surgery after that, gastrotomy. But if it's a bone, then you don't need, uh, it has been proven that you don't need anything. Uh, rarely dogs uh, have gastritis out of the bones that we proceed into uh, the stomach. And of course, as you saw here, we only estimate the esophagitis only after we have removed uh, the bone. We are going to um, uh, actually have a look at the foreign bodies that the cats uh, digest and later on at the foreign bodies that the dogs digest. In terms of cats, cats are smarter. They do not digest a lot of uh, foreign bodies. Uh, dogs are more prone to digest and swallow foreign bodies. And uh, most of the times yeah, in the esophagus, uh, we have foreign bodies embedded and lodged in dogs and not in cats. Uh, so the reported foreign bodies in cats are strings, needles, fish hooks, bones, and uh, trichobezoars. Actually, trichobezoar is, is one of the most uh, common uh, foreign body. And if they are left for a long time, they can be really hard like plastic objects. Um, and where are the common locations? The common locations are where the esophagus normally is narrowed. And this is in the thoracic inlet, in the heart base, and um, just prior to the cardia, uh, to the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. So we also have an entity in cats that's called chronic esophageal foreign bodies. Um, that, that's mostly uh, due to the um, to the uh, to these uh, trichobezoars actually, and they cause chronic vomiting, they cause hypersalivation, dysphagia, everything that a foreign body uh, can uh, actually cause. Please look always look um, your cats when they're coming with hypersalivation. Uh, we will see a case later on. Always check your cats. Um, underneath the tongue. You have to sedate them in order to see them. You see how well embedded this string is underneath the tongue that you cannot see it unless you sedate the animal. And this is uh, a cat that actually swallowed needles. Needles are very easy to come out when they have the thread. So sometimes I, I say two things to the emergency uh, cases and to my nurses when people call at the clinic. First, if there is a string underneath the mouth, you know, or out coming outside of the mouth of the cat or the dog, or in hooks, this uh, string, plastic string, do not cut the string. Do not push, pull, sorry, and do not cut. These are the two rules. Whenever they tell me that uh, it swallowed uh, a needle or it swallowed uh, a hook, the first two instructions that you always give is don't pull and don't cut because it will be much, much easier for you. Um, I know that it's a kind of reflex uh, of owners and even of vets sometimes just to pull to see how embedded the hook or the needle is, but this makes it worse. So two instructions, don't pull, don't cut. Okay, it's much, much easier to uh, have the needle with the thread and to take it out rather than having uh, the needle by itself. 
another needle here. So not all black cats get the needles, some orange cats as well. Uh, this is another case. When you have a dog living with your cat, please beware of the colors of permethrin uh, that your dog might be wearing because we have a lot of cases that cats rub on dogs if you put a permethrin spot on, for example, or that cats might eat just as this poor black cat. It's different. You can see the towel. It's not the same cat that uh, swallowed the needle. So this poor cat just swallowed the color, the anti-parasitic color of the dogs, uh, of the dog in the family. So um, the symptoms might start 36 hours, even immediately, um, but mostly one day, maybe 24 hours uh, after the ingestion. And of, of course, it always depends on the amount of the ingestion. In this poor cat, it only happened two to three hours post ingestion because as you see, um, this cat practically swallowed the whole uh, antiparasitic color. So the symptoms were vomiting, uh, hypersalivation, of course, all the toxicosis uh, symptoms, loss of orientation, midriasis, opening, wide opening of the eyes, twitching, seizures, and of course, labored uh, breathing. So please be aware of that as well. Let's go to another very, very common, especially in New Year's Eve, all of my New Year's Eve, you're going to see the, uh, that the dates on these videos are 1, 1st of January, 2016, 1st of January, 2017. So practically all of my uh, New Year's Eves, uh, I've, I've been in, uh, in the endoscopic room retrieving coins because this is the, the lucky coins that we put in a pie. For, um, for New Year's Eve. Um, the, this coin, this is why you see that this coin is covered because it's embedded in a pie, uh, but you might have other covers as well. Uh, you might have other coins that are not embedded and I want you to take to be aware of the, um, of the uh, yellow coins I'm gonna show you. So this is a cat actually, and cats are really, really difficult to swallow coins, but this is a cat and you can see the esophagus of the cat and the vascularity. Um, we can tell that this is uh, an esophagus of a cat. And I'm going with the grasping forceps. There are other methods to uh, grasp the coins as well. These net uh, graspers uh, that you can just put the, the coin in the net grasper and close it. This is a very good one uh, as well. So this was the coin, this was the uh, x-ray, and this is a poor dog that has ingested. Um, these are the dangerous coins. And we're talking about zinc toxicosis. Zinc toxicosis is very, very um, um, dangerous because it can cause hemolytic anemia. So the dog might come or the cat might not come with the symptoms of the foreign body, but they might come with the symptoms of melina and hematemesis and very um, uh, low blood, uh, uh, very low blood, uh, red blood count, um, and a very low HCT uh, due to uh, intravascular hemolysis and ictus and tachycardia. So have an x-ray in, uh, in these animals as well. We always have to do anyways uh, in our diagnostic procedure. Uh, because this might be due to a coin. Um, batteries and coins are really, really poisonous. And these are the, the foreign bodies that you cannot leave for the next day. You can leave a plastic object in the stomach for the next day if you're not afraid or scared that this will be uh, preceded in the intestines. But you cannot leave coins or um, metallic objects in uh, the abdomen. Okay, let's have a case. Let's see our first uh, case. So this is, it's not, you know, I was, while I was fixing these uh, slides, I was um, reviewing my cases and is it by luck that all the animals that have swallowed something are, are males? I don't know, I'm sorry. Uh, I have to apologize to the men attending the, the webinar, but 
every, even the cats are male cats. I don't know what to, to say about that. Anyway, so uh, we have Bala, 10 years old, 10 years old, he's a 10 years old cat, fully vaccinated and dewormed, strictly indoors. There's no other cat in the household. And Bala, what started doing is regurgitation um, and vomiting episodes. And we will talk in another webinar about how to distinguish. People think that it's very easy to distinguish vomiting from regurgitation, but I'm going to challenge you on that. And I'm going to show you cases that the, this thin line is not that thin and that medicine is not black and white. So, um, but this cat started having both symptoms, both regurgitation and uh, vomiting symptoms. And as you see, this cat is drooling, hypersalivating. Uh, the first thing uh, we always do when we have a, a cat drooling or hypersalivating is check the, um, uh, the oral cavity for ulcers, for stomatitis, for um, maybe um, a, a string, as we said. And it is very, very common for cats. You will see that uh, when they're when you have them hospitalized. Cats with GI signs and with uh, vomiting and nausea, what they do is that they extend, they, they have this neck extension. They always do this thing. This is very, very indicative of uh, a GI uh, disease, something going on in the gastrointestinal lumen. So we had regurgitation with increasing frequency over the last week, vomiting gastric fluids, dysphagia. Uh, she wanted to, uh, he wanted to eat, sorry. Uh, Bella wanted to eat, but he couldn't. Uh, he could apprehend the food, but um, it was not possible to swallow the food. And uh, the cat actually was uh, vocalizing whenever swallowing the food. Um, neck extension, as we said, better toleration of the liquid meals than the solid meals and of course weight loss not because the cat did not have had lost the appetite but because it couldn't actually um swallow the food so clinical examination when we saw it it was five out of nine so it was kind of ideal uh the body weight um though it had lost so it should be a bit uh, overweight before this episode uh, we had tachycardia, we had dehydration, and probably the tachycardia is due to the dehydration. In the digital palpation, we didn't um, uh, detect any uh, feces, and you will always do, not on a live cat, on a sedated cat, the digital palpation, please, because I always talk about the digital palpation, and people say, how are we going to do a digital palpation? Not on a live cat, you sedate the cat and you see. You always do that in GI cases because you want to detect if there is melina that the owner has not um, uh, actually detected. Uh, you want to see if there's air. Are there any feces? How long has it been since the cat has defecated? Okay. And uh, there was in the palpation of the cranial abdomen, we had a bit of uh, a pain. Of course, you know that cats are really difficult to uh, exhibit and express pain. So you have to be very, very uh, cautious on how to interpret the pain. There is an amazing the uh, amazing uh, scale by Paolo Stigl, um, uh, the feline grimace, uh, grimace scale that you can just take a snapshot of your cat and um, put it in the uh, application and they will tell you the grading of the and the scaling of the uh, pain that the cat is in. Um, Paolo has done an amazing, amazing work on, uh, on that, on feline pain and how to detect it, because then it's easier to address it and we always forget about it. Okay. So whenever we have a GI case, what we do, we have to differentiate between these two big categories. The first one is the extra GI, um, diseases that can cause GI symptoms that can reflect symptoms to the GI tract, but they are not originated in the uh, GI lumen. And these are intra-abdominal systemic diseases, drugs and toxins, as we previously, previously said, like permethrin, uh, mastocytosis mostly for dogs, 
Neurological causes, when you have a brain tumor, then you vomit, but this is not a gastrointestinal disease, okay? Infectious diseases and metabolic endocrine, please, in dogs, do not forget about. Addison's disease, I will never stop uh, saying that because I have a, a lot of referral ca cases that are Addisonians and we, you know, for scoping, referral for end endoscopic cases because they vomit and they have diarrhea and they're not GI cases, they are endocrine patients. Uh, endocrinology patients, and in cats, never ever forget about hyperthyroidism. This cat is 10 years old. He should be checked for hyperthyroidism anyway. So you always palpate also the thyroid gland and you do a T4 level. Um, that's basic for cats um, older than seven years old, okay? Uh, hyperthyroidism can give both uh, vomiting and regurgitation. Some cats cut, come with regurgitations because uh, hyperthyroidism can cause hypomotility in the esophagus. So if the cat is regurgitating and not vomiting, don't say that it's not hyperthyroidism. Okay. And then we go to the gastrointestinal uh, tract. If we exclude everything extra intestinal, we go to the um, gastrointestinal tract and we try to localize the lesion. Just as the neurologist trying to localize the lesion, we try to localize the lesion. Is it an esophageal disease? Is it stomach disease? Um, a gastric disease? Is it an intestinal, a small intestinal disease? Could it be uh, implicating more uh, organs like in triaditis, for example, where we have the pancreas, the small intestine um, uh, and the liver? Uh, could it be a combination of organs that uh, contribute to the pathology of the disease? In cats also, when you have a hypersalivating cat, never, never stop to uh, have as a consideration hepatic encephalopathy because they express, cats express uh, hepatic encephalopathy totally different than dogs. They do not do these seizures and uh, these neurological, uh, prominent neurological uh, symptoms that dogs exhibit, what they do is that they get aggressive. So they have, we have high aggression and we have drooling and hypersalivation most of the times in lymphatic encephalopathy. Okay, so don't, don't uh, push it out of your differential diagnosis. And these are all the gastrointestinal causes. Of course, we're not gonna go through that because we're mostly focused in endoscopy right now. Um, but I want to um, bring your attention. These are the infectious diseases, enteric coronavirus, FIP or uh, FELD. Please do all the, uh, the panels priorly to scope these animals. What are the hematology? Because when you start examining and setting the diagnosis for an animal, you have to start from zero. I have a lot of cases, again, referred that uh, they vomit for two weeks and they send them off for endoscopy. We have to take it from step one, which is hematology, biochemistry, then it's imaging, abdominal ultrasound, or an x-ray, and then it's endoscopy. So we have to do things in order. I know that a lot of owners will not pay, but you are the doctors. You are the ones who define the wellness of the animal and what strategy has to be plotted. And you have always to, you know, to tell them what to do. And if they don't, it's their own decision. You always have to um, suggest, to make the suggestion. Otherwise, they will come and tell you that you didn't make the suggestion uh, up front. So we have uh, an elevated HCT, which is probably due to dehydration. We have a stress leukogram. Uh, in cats, you can have, I mean, the white blood cells of this cat could be uh, were around 23,000 uh, uh, white blood cells. Is it an inflammation? Is it a stress leukogram? Cats, cats can have up to uh, threefold up when they're stressed, their uh, white blood cells. So we will recheck that. We'll keep that in mind and we will recheck. Uh, lymphopenia, so we have neutrophilia and lymphopenia it could be a stress leukogram. This rings a bell for a stress uh, leukogram. Okay, the BUN elevated, pre-renal azotemia, dehydration, as we said, the total uh, proteins elevated, again, 
for the same reason, of course, we have to check the infectious diseases, and this gap was negative for infectious diseases for FIP, FL, uh, FLB, and uh, FIV. Um, all the um, liver enzymes normal, the electrolytes due to the vomiting episodes, because regurgitation does not, it can cause hyponatremia, for example, uh, but most of the time, if you have severe hypokalemia, then it's due to vomiting episodes as well. And hypochloremia. So we have a lot of uh, metabolic disturbances here, electrolyte disturbances. This was the x-ray of uh, the cat. Nothing remarkable, actually, to tell you uh, the truth. And let's go to the endoscopy. Can you see this string here? Now we are in the intestine. So we're not in the stomach. We are in the intestine. And we are retrieving back our endoscope in order to see where we are. Okay, so now we got out of the pylorus. This is the pylorus, and the pylorus is so tight, torn in two by this string. Can you see that, this yellow string here? It has shrinked all the pylorus in the intestine on, and this is the incisura angularis. It's like it's cut in half by this string. This is how tense it is. So if you find the string underneath the tongue, don't go on to grasping the string and pushing it or pulling it because it, you will only cause damage if this string is in the intestine anyway. So now we're in the esophagus and it goes up. So this string is going from the small intestine up to the stomach, up to the esophagus. Okay, and even if you try to pull, to pull it from the esophagus, it will not come out. What we do in these cases is that I have my surgeons do an enterotomy. So they cut the string, they stitch very, very quickly the intestines, and I get the rest of the string from the stomach so as not to have a gastrotomy. I know that for surgeons, it's very easy to have a gastrotomy as well, but I do not want, if we have a scope handy at that point, it is better not to have two sections in the abdomen. An abdomen that's opened, it's never gonna be the same. Uh, so it's better to do it that way if you have the, the luxury of the scope. Of course, if you don't, yes, you have to go into the stomach as well and do a uh, gastrotomy. Sometimes it's not easy to pull the whole foreign body out of the stomach. And I'm not talking about this small string as well. So these are my collection. I have a big collection of cats that they have this, is, this was actually the cat that was scoped with this yellow string, and you can see how much it was embedded in the tongue. I don't know how many days this poor cat had um, the string underneath uh, the tongue. And of course, another cat with um, uh, a red string, please always check for the strings. Okay. And... For Bella, what we did, of course, is to restore the electrolyte uh, imbalances, administer IV fluids, get her to the OP, and of course, second generation, uh, first generation uh, cephalosporins, because the, the foreign body uh, actually was, uh, we didn't know if it, if, uh, it had necrosis um, in the intestine, so uh, the foreign body was embedded for, this string was there for more than uh, a week, more than 10 days, prophylactic uh, first generation cephalosporins, and then to the op room. And of course, then nutritional support, you can feed, force feed with a syringe. I place most of the time nasogastric tubes, place them in the correct way, not this way, uh, because they are very, very irritated in their master sheet. They, they don't like have the tube uh, on the side. And always, always beware of the refeeding syndrome. Don't feed huge amounts because the phosphorus might fall, the, the potassium might fall uh, again, and you can have hemolytic uh, anemia due to the quick uh, refeeding. 
This is very, very common in humans and in cats. It's not that common in dogs, but please always be aware of the refeeding syndrome. And whoever does not know about this syndrome, go and study about it, okay? You will become better in your aftercare um, hospitalization. And of course, we always give B12, a cat that has been anorexic, that has been, that has lost weight, needs B12. It's definite that they will have a deficit. We used to do that uh, subcutaneously, but there are a lot of uh, studies now uh, from UC Davis that you can give them orally for a long period of time and they can do the same. Uh, they can be as much efficient. Okay, let's see this case. This case was actually, this, um, this is a case that was sent by the owner. The video is sent by the owner. And you can see that the dog has very much appetite. It can apprehend the food and they can have the first uh, stage of chewing very well. But look at the second stage of chewing. Actually, it's when they try to swallow it in the pharyngeal uh, area. Is this pharyngeal dysphagia? Is this pharyngeal regurgitation or something else? So this dog, was referred by the vet after this video without being examined, without doing anything. So you see that this food dog tries to swallow, tries, but it can't. So it wants to expel the food. The food is not expelled, but there is definite discomfort in the pharyngeal uh, area. So it stays there. It's very, very, important to understand the stages of the discomfort. Is it esophageal discomfort? Is it pharyngeal discomfort? This is what we're, when we're talking about localization of the lesion, this is what we're talking about. So you see how it opened the doors and it cannot swallow the chewed food. Okay. Okay, let's go and see what it was. So the minute I tried to scope this animal because he was referred. We did all the blood work and everything. The dog was sedated. And actually this was the first dog that I had with strings like a cat. So it had a string. And fortunate for this dog, the string was only extending to the esophagus. So we didn't even have to scope it. We just took out the string and everything was fine. So it's a pity not to sedate the animal and do an oral examination, a pharyngeal examination before referring it, because you might, you know, win a lot of cases and not refer them to bigger hospitals. Let's go to dogs. I know that the breeds for predisposition are the terrier breeds. These are my best clients and the small breed uh, animals, uh, the, the small breed dogs. But I have to tell you that I have a ton of Labradors. I don't know about you. Please write in the uh, chat box. I have a lot of goofy Labradors that eat practically everything. And if we have time in the end, I'm going to tell you a story uh, when I was in Bristol University. Um, and it was actually the first, second week that uh, I was there. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about this Labrador later on. So uh, most commonly, dogs chew and swallow bones, toys, balls, hooks, and toothpicks, and lots of other uh, stuff, practically everything, uh, clothes as well. And the symptoms depend on where the uh, location of the foreign body uh, is uh, embedded. But most of the time, it's retching, gagging, ptilism, repeated swallowing attempts, just as in cats, they do this all the time. Regurgitation, of course, dysphagia, odinophagia. Odinophagia is a Greek word, and it means um, swallowing with pain, with painful, uh, with a painful feeling. So it's painful swallowing, actually. Tachypnea, we have a lot of breathing, especially if we have an aspiration pneumonia uh, and labored breathing, if we have an aspiration pneumonia. Let's go and see a bit about the clinical symptoms. What about if we have the foreign body in the pharyngeal or uh, in the pharyngeal part of the esophagus or in the pharyngeal uh, area? I have to highlight that this dog 
was admitted to the clinic because they were, it was referred for a cardiology case, as a cardiology case uh, or respiratory case because they thought that it had pulmonary edema. So we put it on oxygen here up until we sedate it and have an x-ray. This is in the x-ray room. You see that the tongue is cyanotic. Whenever you see a cyanotic tongue, always think about an obstruction. Have you seen the sound that this animal is doing? It cannot breathe properly and it's from the upper airways or the pharyngeal region. So you have always to localize your, le your lesion. This is not lower uh, respiratory disease. This is not heart. The dog was bright and alert but cyanotic, something was obstructing the airways. Okay, and let's see, I'm gonna show you the endoscopy of this dog later. Let's see about this one here. This has actually a foreign body in the esophageal, in the thoracic inlet. And you see that this dog is gagging all the time. It's doing, even in, in its sleep, it cannot rest all the time. It has ptialism and gagging. You will see another gagging now. You see? It's like regurgitation, maybe gastroesophageal reflex, and it's gagging the poor thing all the time, even in its sleep. Okay. This is a foreign body in the thoracic inlet. It doesn't mean that a foreign body in the thoracic inlet will only have this a clinical symptom, but once you see he, this symptom, just be aware of what it might uh, be behind it, okay? What it might be as an underlying disease. Let's go to this, to this poor poodle. This poodle actually has a foreign body in proximal to the lower esophageal sphincter. So you see that it's doing this stretching movements, this stretching of the neck all the time, and it has ptialism. It never sees, sees to, 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 uh, to do lip licking all the time. And it seems that the animal is really, really uh, uncomfortable. Let's go to this one here. This poor one. It is very, very obvious that this dog is in pain, actually. It's very obvious. You can see it shaking. And this is a gastric foreign body. But actually, it was not a gastric foreign body. It was a gastric uh, going into the duodenum foreign body. And this dog had projectile vomitings, had a pyloric uh, obstruction as well. And you can see the movement. What else could we say about these animals? What, what else uh, could it be? Could be pancreatitis, but something very, very painful in the abdomen. Could it be, for example, spinal cord disease? Yes, could be. So um, you have to keep your differentials open. Okay. And let's see the six chew with the bone. You can see a bone sitting vertically, uh, horizontally, sorry, not vertically, horizontally in the pharyngeal region. So this dog had swallowed the bone and the bone just stays here in the pharyngeal region. And actually it was obstructing the airways as well. So the dog could not breathe. This is why the cyanotic uh, breathing and uh, the cyanotic uh, tongue and the labored breathing that it had. Okay, and that was a very easy for anybody to remove. And of course, dogs can, you know, practically consume everything from plastic fans, male, dog, from toy materials, male, all ages of male dogs here. And I have a huge, huge collection. And also we have a very huge collection in the children's hospital that I was actually practicing. Uh, they have a whole wall of foreign bodies that children 
might uh, swallow as well. So I have to, to, to say that children are more uh, imaginative. They swallow, you know, things that you cannot even imagine. But anyway, toys, uh, a lighter with a pig on it, a toy, bones. That's pretty much my everyday life. Clothes. And sometimes um, the surgeons ask me, would it be better, for example, to take the clothes out with a gastrotomy? It, will, it would be much, much easier and much quicker. And I agree that it might be quicker, but I tend not to open abdomens, even if I have to stay for long in the stomach. I would not, there, there's only one case that I would not stay long in, in the stomach, to tangle the pylorus. If you see that in the first 20, 25 minutes, you cannot tangle the pylorus, please do not stay two hours and try hard. Because the harder you try, the pylorus will be much, much uh, firmer and closer, okay? So we actually, tried to take out every piece of this cloth. And it was fortunate that uh, the clothes had not proceeded to the intestines and that the pylorus was not uh, obstructed. This is the first thing that we uh, actually look in these uh, materials when we have cloth material. Okay, and when you have socks, don't give apomorphine, don't give an, uh, an emetic agent, just go in, and take the, uh, it's good practice. And also it's not good, for the, you know, the nausea feeling that the animal is uh, afterwards feeling. And especially if you don't know when the animal has digested the foreign body. So we take out every bits and bits of this cloth, uh, which was, I do not know what kind of a cloth it was actually. Maybe it was uh, a towel, maybe it was socks but it has ripped them all apart. Okay, and that's my nurse, Beata, and my other nurse, Livia. There are a lot of people in there. So we went in and out and in and out and harvested all these clothes in order not to have the procedure, the surgical uh, procedure, okay? And you have to be very, very aware afterwards to deflate the stomach so as not to cause uh, gastric dilation. Okay. And you have to be patient. Sometimes endoscopy is for patient people. Staples, my collection of staples here. This is a whippet. I don't know how many of you know the souvlaki sticks. This is not a toothpick, it's a souvlaki stick in Greece. People, especially uh, at night, are used into ordering, uh, not burgers, but souvlaki sticks. These are the souvlaki sticks. And if you are lucky and that the meat is digested, then it's very easy to take them out. But if you're not lucky and you have to look through, because sometimes the animals swallow the whole thing with the meat, and it's very difficult to take it out of the um of the stick and sometimes you only get to see a very small tiny this this was the the tiny tiny part that you were able to see and the rest of it is meat um and sometimes the stick is so much embedded in the meat that you cannot take it out so it's a bit of a hurdle for countries that souvlaki is in circulation you're going to go with a firm, a very firm grasper there, um, not a rat tooth, an alligator jaw, because you really need strength for these kind of uh, foreign bodies if they are embedded in the meat. Okay. And, oh, about this, this first video, what I wanted to comment on is that sometimes you think it's very easy to take the stick out, but uh, once you get lose the grasp, uh, in the uh, in the esophagus, then you just proceed your grasp and proceed your grasp and you never get it in the esophagus because you don't have the vertical side, you know, to grasp it. And sometimes you lose it here in the pharyngeal region due to the pharyngeal um, sphincter. 
And here we have, I know that somebody raised his hands. We're gonna please type your question and we're gonna answer all the questions later as well. And we have a um, five-year-old male again, uh, Westy, uh, that just swallowed a bone. Let's see the, the scoping. Unfortunately, this dog has not only swallowed the the bone. After the bone, they gave them they gave him steak. As you can see, there's a lot of meat here, um, and that that was afterwards. They have given him bread. They have given him meat in order to. They thought that this way it would be easier to swallow the bone. The first thing that you do when you have a, a, a very embedded bone in the esophagus is to check sideways and to see if the bone is movable or not. And of course, to take all the other materials out of uh, the way so that you can estimate um, and uh, have a plan afterwards. Set an endoscopic plan on how you're going to retrieve uh, the, the foreign uh, body. And sometimes, as I said, you can retrieve it. Sometimes you will proceed it, especially if it's bone, into the abdomen and you will see the damage that has been done. How do we proceed in the abdomen? We either use the tubes that we use for gastric dilation or the gastric tubes that we use for gastric dilation or the tip of the scope. The tip of the scope, you have to be very, very careful not to damage your scope. So I'm not suggesting that you're doing it. It needs a lot of experience in order to proceed a foreign body with the tip of, of your scope without harming uh, your scope. Okay, but it, it, it has been described in literature as well. Uh, so now what I'm trying to do here is to see if this bone is movable or not and what kind of damage you see that I am at the base of the heart. You see the heart pounding here, okay. And you will see here, after the removal, the, the esophagitis, and also I'm checking uh, the stomach. Mostly what I do is I take the air out of the stomach because after this trial uh, and all the efforts that we did, the, uh, the stomach is fully distended. So I take the air out, and then I estimate the esophagitis. This uh, foreign body was only for two or three hours and look at the esophagitis, but this is not a candidate for stricturing. Okay. Um, and I put my HBE on, which means the myemoglobin enhancer. And you can see how prominent the lesions are with this alpha scope. You can see the lesions of the esophagitis much easier um, in order to construct uh, a therapeutic plan after that. And this part has been left, but this is tiny and I'm trying to shove it off to the, um, into the stomach. I'm trying to push it in uh, the stomach. I don't want to take it out again because there has been a lot of damage in the esophagus and you can see that the esophagitis is up to the pharyngeal region. Okay, so once we push it in, we wash the esophagus always. We rinse it with our uh, either distilled water. And if it's very painful and if the esophagitis is very severe, then I tend to put zilocaine um, gel um, diluted with normal saline throughout the esophagus so that it's less painful. Okay. And that was a very, very difficult bone. We actually have tried to retrieve it. This is why you see so much blood. It's from us because we tried to grasp it with different graspers, but it didn't go out. Uh, this is embedded more than one week. And these are the worst ones. These are the worst ones. They do not go forward. They do not go back. You either have to tear the esophagus or you have to be very, very careful. So. This, this bone here was not moving at all. It was embedded. And um, as you see, it's very, very lodged in the mucosa, in the esophageal mucosa. We, we actually uh, proceeded the bone with a tube. Um, and I don't have an image of how to proceed it because I don't do it, uh, I did it blindly. 
um, you have to be very careful if you're doing it blindly. You can do it um, with uh, under visualization with your scope in the tube, um, but with experience, um, you get to do it blindly as well. So I did it blindly and then I checked to see if the bone is in the stomach and I don't get it out. I take the air out of the stomach and then I always uh, check for the esophagitis afterwards, after we have removed. And this was a nasty esophagitis in this dog. And this was a candidate for stricturing two uh, weeks later as well. This is the incisura. I'm checking the stomach. The dog also has gastritis because this is a regular consumer of foreign bodies and materials. Okay, and you will see, let me check the, the hour, okay. And, and you will see the uh, degree of esophagitis as well in this dog. You see how much of a damage. It doesn't even need your hemoglobin enhancer to detect how much of a damage this has done. This dog was very fortunate, and it's just prior to the cardia, this one, to the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay. These are the most common places for a foreign body to be lodged. We wash very well the esophagus. And as we go up, you will see that the esophagitis is only located in the area where the foreign body was lodged. But a huge trauma. Sulcrophate, PPI inhibitors, twice a day, okay. Antibiotics in these cases. Now let's talk about hooks, the story of my life with hooks. They can be lodged anywhere. They can be lodged in the cardia, they can be lodged, here it is in the stomach, in the pyloric region, they can be lodged in the esophagus, anywhere. I do not know if you have a problem with hooks in your country. The most difficult ones are the ones that you have to, that are embedded in the cardia. So you have to work all the time on J maneuver. These are the most difficult ones because first you are afraid you don't have a, a big um, range of movements to do. And secondly, you are scared of your scope, what to do with the scope. So the thing to do with the, um, with, uh, the hooks is always to, to try to precede them uh, forward, so, but always try to see where the uh, the tip of the hook might arise, as I did here. So you always try to precede them and take them from the tip, from the pointed tip out. Otherwise, you cannot do it. You cannot, even if you push and pull hard, the hook will be more embedded. This is the only way to take the hook out from this point. And it would be great to have an overtube here, for example, in order to put the hook in the overtube and have the esophagus safer. Okay. Of course, we have other poly multiple hooks in the pharyngeal region. These are really, really difficult because there is no space here to, um, to work. And as I have to point out, you can see that the story of my life is 1st of January, 2020. And 2 of January is because it passed midnight. So I had all my New Year's Eve taking out the hook, whoever goes fishing or the dog for a walk. And, you know, the dog might eat a hook in New Year's Eve. I do not know. This, this was a whole new experience for me. So this hook is embedded in the pharyngeal uh, region. You will see it here under the, as we enter the uh, esophagus, under the glottis here, here it is. There's no, there's a lot of saliva here. So there you don't have a lot of space in order to assess where the point of the hook is heading. 
this is a very difficult case, actually. You're so close to get it out, and it's very difficult to get it out because all the structures of the respiratory tract, the glottis and everything are very close by. You have your ET tube that's pressing the pharyngeal sphincter as well. So even if you're so close in getting it out, it's very difficult to do it on a safe way, I mean. And of course, we always assess the esophagitis and the damage that has been done after the removal. There hasn't been much damage, some blood here, just uh, for the trauma from pushing and pulling, uh, from manipulating the hooks. So uh, this wasn't much of a problem. You see how close we are into the, um, this is the upper esophageal uh, sphincter, the pharyngeal uh, sphincter actually. And this is a very, very stiff sphincter. Uh, this sphincter closes and I have to keep my lumen up in order to have visibility. And I don't have visibility. There's no space to work there. The procedure is always the same. You're trying to find the point, the pointy tip, and take it out from the curve of the, uh, of the hook. And this is what I'm desperately trying to do in my New Year's Eve. That was not a coin. I had, you know, a variety. One New Year's Eve uh, is coins, and the other New Year's Eve is hooks. It's a good to have uh, a life of varieties and multiple activities. Okay, now I have revealed the curve of the hook after trying for so long. It took us half an hour to take it out and it practically takes me less than 15 minutes to take out a hook. You see that we started off at midnight. Actually, it was midnight, midnight, midnight. And we finished 34 uh, midnight, half past midnight, half past 12. And a lot of saliva, so you have to uh, suction everything again and again and again. And what I'm trying to do now is another technique because it's not being dislodged. So I take my grasping forceps and I'm proceeding it inwards in the esophagus so that maybe if it doesn't come out, it will be in the esophageal uh, lumen. Proceed it and it will be easier for me to take it out. And this is how we took it out actually. So this is why you're seeing me preceding the forceps, okay? And this loosens up a bit the tightness of the, of the hook. And at last we took it off. And I'm doing that again, I'm proceeding again inside the lumen. This was it, such a tiny thing and, you know, do so much double and damage. Um, another hook in the esophageal sphincter and <clears throat> neither the curve nor the pointy uh, thing is shown. That's very scary because you think that it might be in the lungs. Where is the hook? You know, and now we're trying the, my first movements, your first movements in this case, if you only see the straight part of the hook will be to recognize in which direction the pointy part of the hook is uh, actually showing. Because if you don't understand that, you will never take it off. So you see now that I'm, I'm actually realizing where my curve is and where the pointy part might, uh, might be, okay? In order to retrieve it, otherwise you will never retrieve it. And this is the very small damage that we did, no bleeding, no nothing, but this is a very, very peculiar place to work because as I said, there is no, uh, there is no workspace. Okay. 
I'm not trying to push it. I'm trying to see there's a difference. I'm trying to see where the pointy part is being lodged, okay? Where the pointy part will show. And then I'm trying to push it back upwards, as you see. Okay, enough with the hooks. What I want to really, really point your attention is that there are some foreign bodies that are just staying there in the esophagus without being lodged. And in these cases, it's very easy for you to either proceed them in the stomach or retrieve them like, let's say, a piece of fish or a piece of apple that shouldn't stay there. And then you are heroes, the dog goes home, and then one month later, they come again with another foreign body in the esophagus. So you always have to see the underlying cause. There are some, like this very, very small piece of pear, I think it is, a piece of fruit just lodged in the esophagus. And you see how much space we have here. This, this foreign body shouldn't be lodged Actually, this dog had hypothyroidism, so it had underlying hypomotility. So we always have to be careful if you see a foreign body that shouldn't be there um, or shouldn't be stuck in the esophagus, you should always think about underlying motility disorders, okay? And make the owners aware of the problem and that it needs to be investigated. And of course, we can have delayed gastric uh, emptying due to mechanical obstruction in the pyloric region. I think that I have shown you this one. This is a huge uh, cloth. Actually, it's shoelaces that this animal has chewed. And these shoelaces have made a bundle and they have obstructed the pyloris. Uh, you should always, when you're trying to take and test the tension. You should always go back to the pylorus and see if the pylorus is free or not. Otherwise, if there's too much tension, you cannot take uh, the foreign body out. You should tell your surgeon to first cut it from the intestine, as I said, and then release it into the, uh, the stomach. And what I will do here is that I will try uh, to actually it stopped. Okay. I will try to um, actually test the tension. Okay, there are, of course there might be other causes of uh, obstruction, pyloric obstruction. But what I do is first I go to grasp a part to see how much tension, if it comes easily onto the esophagus. This is a huge bundle. This is a huge bundle, as you see. The whole stomach is full of shoelaces. So I will take some up and then I will leave them into the esophagus and I will go back to the pyloris, to the pyloric region, and try to unleash some more. And then back to the pyloris and then try to unleash some more. Because you cannot just bring it out like that. Most of the times it's very difficult. So this is up to where it comes, okay? And that's it. It can go no further than that. And then I go back, I leave whatever I have brought in the esophagus, and then I go back and take some more. This is the, the best I can do in the esophagus right now. So I go back in the stomach, and retrieve some more and some more. And when it all comes up to the esophagus, then I'm trying to grasp with a big alligator's jaw, uh, the, bigger, the biggest bundle that I can in order to try to uh, handle it and take it out. Okay, so now I'm going back to the stomach. I will leave whatever I brought and I'm taking back to the stomach and bringing some more and bringing some more. So don't just try because I see some of my residents and they're trying to push and push one edge. It will never come out. It will never come out. You have to go back and bring some more and back and bring some more. Okay.
And as we're watching this, there's a very good question. In case um, it HV, I don't understand. In case uh, a complete obstruction of foreign body in esophagus, do you have any special technique uh, such as put the balloon to release it or anything else to remove foreign body easily and not to harm or more trauma? Yeah. Um, in case of a complete obstruction of the foreign body, actually, it never happened to me that I could not push a foreign body. Even if I cannot retrieve it, don't be focused on retrieving always the foreign bodies, okay? You can push them, especially if they are bones or stuff like that, you can push them, not the balloon. I never put the balloon dilation, the dilators because I don't know the actually elasticity of the esophagus at that point. And I do not know if the esophagus will tear up or not. So what I do is I try to put the scope sideways. Um, I will put the over tube in order to see, to check, to open my lumen and see uh, what I can do with my forceps in the um, in this um, in the over tube. And another thing that you can do is that there are these big forceps that we use mostly in laparoscopy. Uh, and sometimes under visualization though, always, uh, I can cut the foreign body in, uh, in two. Rarely I do that because I, I mostly want to push the foreign body, the whole foreign body in the stomach. Um, and it actually works. Believe me, all the bones that we have proceeded into the stomach, none of the animals ever had gastritis or needed a gastrectomy. It's different with the um, plastic materials, of course. Okay, and to wrap it up, these are some very, very good advice for all of you. It's never good to take out your wedding ring for any reason. This was a gentleman that had come um, has taken off his ring, uh, his wedding ring, put it in the next to his bed, as he said, I don't know. And the cat swallowed the wedding ring and he went on like, you know, doctor, please, please take the, the wedding ring out of the stomach of the cat and I will do anything. Um, and I told him to, to give his wife a very, very good present. Um, this was a German shepherd actually that had come and my residence, it was very, very late at night. And my residence said that, uh, doctor, there is a foreign body in the stomach. We cannot say what it was. And I said, it's a duck. Ask him if, you know, he has babies or if the dog was in the bathroom. And he said, the owner said, oh my God, I left the dog with the baby in the bathtub. Yes. And it was a duck. You can see here the, uh, the actual uh, face of the duck and the body of the duck. This was uh, an eraser pen. A Jack Russell actually has swallowed that. Uh, that. That's a very nice story and I have a video for that. So this is a Labrador and this Labrador is called Valentino, okay? Because this, this plays a huge role. So Valentino uh, is in love with the Labrador of the, of, uh, the neighbor. So they go out every day, uh, you know, for walks, for long walks. And one day, so this is actually the color that's, and here is the color uh, in the stomach. And I will show you, it was actually the 20th of February. If it was on the 14th of February in Valentine's Day. So Valentino went out for a walk with the dog of the neighbor, the female dog, the female Labrador. and. Uh, out of his passion for her, he ate all the uh, the color. And when I took out the color, it said true love. So this is an amazing love story. Of course, Valentino has had swollen, you know, had swallowed so many other things apart from this color. But this was such a great love story. And if it was not on the 20th of February, but on the 14th of February, it would be epic. But anyway, you know, it was just one week after Valentine's Day. And you will see the color. You have seen it in the previous, uh, you have seen it in the previous uh, image as well. So when we took it all out of the stomach, it said true love. Yes, this is true love and passion.
Okay. And that was, this is the last case I'm going to show you. This was a case actually, uh, again, on emergency. The dog was not cyanotic. It was very well breathing, pink mucus membranes. And they're calling me, my residents call me, and they say that we have a nearing in the esophagus because this uh, chihuahua actually was uh, licking the ear of uh, its owner and it swallowed the earring. So I'm coming to the hospital and I see the x-rays and I say, guys, this is not just a chill for anybody. This is a tracheal for anybody. So you always have to, it shows very well here, but the residents did not thought it was an esophageal for anybody because the animal was breathing so well. And what saved the animal is these three holes here and the, the fact that it was not a closed ring uh, in order to uh, obstruct the trachea. So please always do a DV, it might save you time, money, and also you know to inform the owner that it's a totally different procedure. And that was the earring that we, uh, that we got out. Thank you so much for your interest in science. Thank you so much for your interest in endoscopic procedures. And if there are any more questions, we can answer them now. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it, especially the last tips. Please feel free to ask any questions. And even if something is not popping in your minds now and you want to ask later on, I'm always in the... Okay, in a previous uh, webinar, we talked about misoprostol. Yeah, misoprostol is the only uh, gastric protectant that we use for... Um, ulcers, but for prevention of ulcers, where PPI inhibitors are only therapeutic. You can see that in the BSABA formulary as well. Uh, if you go to misoprostol, uh, you can see it. So the only gastric protectant, if you're giving non-steroidals to an animal that has both prophylactic and uh, therapeutic, um, therapeutic action, is misoprostol because the PPI inhibitors are only therapeutic. They do not have prophylactic action. Okay, against non-steroidals. Um, I am coming to Romania. We have not set the date yet, but uh, mid uh, from, from 15th to 20, 23 of September this week. I'm coming to Romania. Um, any other active substance with prophylactic action? There's not. Not even in humans, there's not. Uh, misoprostol is very difficult to be found in Europe as well now. Um, I know that it's very costly, but unfortunately, all orthopedics and uh, even in veterinary medicine, either in veterinary medicine or in um, human medicine, this is uh, Andrea. I'm really, really sorry. There's no other agent with prophylactic action. All the other agents that we have as gastric protectants are for therapeutic action, like sulfate or PPI inhibitors or uh, H2 antagonists. Everything, all of those are anti-secretory and have um, a therapeutic prophylactic, a, a therapeutic action, not a prophylactic one. The only one that's known to have a prophylactic action against non-steroidals, and I'm saying that um, specifically, is only misoprostol, unfortunately. Special technique to release the complete obstruction in esophagus without harmful. The special technique is to actually put the tube in order to augment your lumen. And another thing is that the tube, the gastric tube will also help you if you have a huge foreign body in the stomach and you cannot proceed it through the esophageal, the lower esophageal uh, sphincter, uh, then uh, what you can do is you can put the tube in the esophageal sphincter to keep it, uh, to keep it open and then 
bring the the scope and your forceps really close to the uh, to your uh, gastric tube and slowly with rotational movements try to uh, bring the uh, the foreign body from the stomach into the uh, esophagus this is the only way I do not use balloons I do not use uh, ET tubes in order to dilate the lumen don't do that because the uh, pressure that you're uh, that you're putting in the esophagus is not radial is not um, isomeric so it could cause problems and tearing thank you Zaharia as well you're you're an incredible audience as well the misoprostol five to ten uh, milligrams per kilo but I have to check that as well five to ten milligrams if you check the BSAVA formula uh, it's there, five, five to 10 milligrams, but beware that the animal is not pregnant because it can cause um, problems with uh, miscarriages, okay? The same is for humans as well. Thank you, Natalie, as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. I really appreciate your attendance. Thank you, Andrea. I hope to see you in Cyprus again when I come. So I think that's pretty much it. Whoever uh, has any more questions, um, Jason can give my email. You can find me in social media. So please don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to um, share your cases and find a solution together. Always two minds or three minds are better than one. So we can, you know, together is always better. Yes, if you Thank want you. to learn more cases, you can uh, subscribe our YouTube channel. There is uh, monthly will be uh, we'll, uh, we will upload uh, clinical cases is uh, supported by Dr. Wasliki. If you're interested in more cases, just you know sub sub subscribe to us. And uh, I want to mention that. Uh, our webinar is a monthly event. So uh, if you are interested in it, uh, please uh, remember to su subscribe our social media like LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. So you will know uh, our next event and then you will come. And finally, I want to say thank you to Dr. Vasliki to bring uh, such an amazing and interesting presentation and uh, say thank you for uh, all the attendees. Thank you for your time. So um, today our webinar is over. If you want, still have some questions, uh, please contact us from the social media or from emails. So thank subscribe you for your time. To Alphabet. Yeah. Subscribe to our vet. We have a very nice case about um, uh, of lymphoma in a cat uh, this month. Uh, it's a very, very interesting case um, because I know that you have a lot of difficulties diagnosing uh, and differentiating IBDs from lymphomas. So we have an overview of that uh, this month. And uh, next month, I have a surprise for you. I have a very, very interesting case to show you. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone. Yeah, have a nice day. Thank you. Goodbye.